Hey, Joe Solari here, and welcome back to the Business of Writing. This is the second part of my interview with Brian Meeks. We did this as one long session, but we clearly were talking about two different subjects, so I split it. Um, the first one, if you did check it out, was about pricing. It's, uh, I think, pretty good information for somebody who's really thinking about developing a pricing strategy. In this one, we're going to talk about moving averages. Brian has got a lot of uh, knowledge around moving averages from his background in economics and statistics. He uses it as a tool in his uh, program that he's written to analyze Amazon ads. We talk a lot about why it's so important, especially with something like Amazon ads where the information is so noisy and so disparate. Um, having something like a moving average really helps you to be able to uh, see the information the way, in a way that's helpful. I'm a big fan of moving averages, and if you've read my book, The Business Owner's Compendium, you know I dedicate a lot of time to having moving averages for your business. I think it's a way for any business to get rid of the seasonality and the noise that comes from sales. For an author, a great application of this is something like uh, page reads, where your daily page reads can be up and down. If you create a simple chart where you're tracking those page reads and you're averaging them over 365 days and then over 28 days, you get all the seasonality taken out. You have removal of things that cause noise like launches and you start to see where the momentum is in your programs that you're running. So it's very, very helpful to deal with something like that. And gets us to be a really simple dashboard indicator where it's like, as long as you see that that 28-day uh, moving average is staying above the 365-day moving average, your business is going to continue to grow. And you can start to get a feel. There's also some extra tools you could apply to change to evaluate the rate of change, so how fast things are moving. But enough of that. Uh, please take the time to listen through this. There's lots of nuggets in here for you if you're into how you can use tools to really make your business work for you. So let's, let's take a, a pivot here. You sure. ready? I, I, I'm, I'm ready. Ready? Does that, yes. seat, does that seat have a seatbelt? It looks like it should. <laughs> it's a very speedy seat, yes. It's got an ejector button. I know that. It does. Oh, there, uh, uh, I, I, there, there is a chair that I want to get that has hydro, hydraulics uh, and a thing for the screens. Uh, um, it, it's it's $12,000. Oh, but it's sexy. <laughs> and, I, and, and I think that may have a seat belt, but it, it's got hydraulics. And I would know, think it would have to. It's just... got all the screens and your keyboard. And just, and, and I, I think it comes with like something that like shoves chips in your mouth and it, 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 it's rated so that when you're weighing 900 pounds because you've never less left your computer seat, it can still handle it. <laughs> that, that, that's my dream. So what we're pivoting to is now we've said that everyone needs to talk about uh, or needs to be doing some research and they have to be uh, looking at the numbers and sure. so let's talk about some ways to help them do that. So in my book, um, when I look at businesses, I'm, I'm a freak about moving averages. I love, I, love, I love them too. Yeah. So when I typically go into a business, one of the things I would do is I would uh, get, say, three years of data and have a 365-day moving average, a 90-day moving average, and a 21-day moving average, and just kind of absorb that data for sales and gross margins. And with that, I can see seasonality in a business. I can understand where to look and say, why, why did this peak and why did this drop? Exactly. And, and the trend lines where, where you see that's, you're talking about the seasonality, mm -hmm. presumably you'll see the shift of the, move, the, the quarterly moving yeah, average. Like 90 day will go like this across. Exactly. The, uh, 365 that will go like that and if it's a product related to agriculture you'll see that in the spring if it's related to the holidays you'll see that in the fall as that starts to mm -hmm. ramp up and 
and most authors, I don't think, understand the beauty of the moving average. I use it just my daily stuff. I use just a seven-day moving average. It lets me know, are my page reads trending up? Are my sales trending up? Or are they not trending up? It tells me, it often shows me when I need to dig deeper and maybe run more ads on a specific book because uh, in, in, you know, sometimes there, there might be a thousand ads and you can't analyze them individually, but you can look at a, look at the whole picture with a moving average mm -hmm. and see, oh, well, this box set series had been trending for three or four months, but you know what? Maybe I've let some of the ads slip. And so I need to go back to that. But in other instances, I did one bit of analysis where the question was, and this was a different author, he let me sort of manage some ads for his books for the duration of this test. And the question was, can you run AMS ads on a first book in free series? We ran, we, I'm not going to say the bid because I often fear when I talk about bids that people assume that's what you need to bid. We ran an aggressively high bid because we wanted to make sure there was enough volume. Mm -hmm. it, this particular study had some interesting characteristics. He is wide, and so there were no KU page reads, which as we talked about earlier, means that now, well, at the time, at least 50% of the potential revenue from these clicks wasn't going to happen. So it was only sales. Could you sell enough? Well, sell. Get enough free downloads with a good enough read-through that at some point in his series, which was eight books, the money you spent would come back in additional revenue from the read-through because that's all there was. And there were components that made it a challenge. For instance, he was averaging 25 downloads a day before we started advertising. So we had to factor in the baseline. And I spent after, I think it was 28 days, because so I didn't even look at his data for almost a month. And when I started looking at it, I spent four or five hours and just couldn't see anything that I thought was interesting. And at the time, I'm just using a seven-day moving average. And, and I'm good at data analysis. And I was just like, I don't see anything in there that is giving me the information I need to draw conclusions. And so I took my data and I did a 21 day moving average. And that was the key. I could immediately see the shift of all the other, well, not all the, at that time at 28 days, I could see a shift in book three from the baseline. Mm -hmm. And so we studied out to about, uh, 60 days and it was clear that there was a plateau at about 19 days compared to without ads and at 19 days the second book would plateau and then about four or five days later the third book would plateau and so on and so forth down the, the line and because mm -hmm. his read-through was really high I was able to take the 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 baseline numbers prior to that for all of his books and simply compare the difference. So, you know, it wasn't looking at total volume of sales. It was, this was the baseline on six months worth of data prior yeah, where he wasn't really getting any advertising and it was flat. And then now the, they've gone up here, 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 and I can take all of those differences and add them together. And there, even though he didn't have any KU page read revenue and we were bidding more than we needed to. His conversion rate was one in every 2.1 people that clicked on an ad got the free download. His, his read-through rate is unlike anything I've ever seen with a first book free. 14% of the people that got the free download went on to read book two. And so he was actually in the black by uh, like, like partway into book four. He was in the black. And so then most of book four, five, six, seven, and eight, the additional revenue there was all, uh, was all profit. And I mean, it, it was a staggering win against all odds. But 
does that mean if you're listening now, if you have an eight book series, you can go first book free and overbid? It does not because the key component there was most authors that I've looked at their first book free, and I've looked at quite a few of them, their read through from book one to two is most of them are around 2%. The really good ones get to maybe 5%, and he was at 14%. Mm -hmm. And because of that, his numbers worked. So it's a case where, I mean, given eight book series, I would wager that maybe one or 2% of the authors that have eight book series could have the same results as he did. So it's a very unique situation, but I could not have gotten there without that seven day moving average because it, it smoothed the data out. And that's what, that's what people don't understand who, I mean, you and I do, because we love moving averages. <laughs> but the value of the moving average is it smooths data out. So if you have daily, the fluctuations of uh, daily up and down, then um, with the moving average, everything becomes sort of a nice line and it's either flowing up or it's flowing down. And when you make a change, you will see that line that's been going along and it's flat and it will pivot. And that pivot point is, is when you made the change. Hopefully it's pivoting up. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, you can try something and it doesn't work, but maybe you're, you know, maybe you're looking at a revenue uh, moving average and you see a pivot down. Well, maybe that, Maybe that's because you decided to drop your, your book from four ninety nine to ninety nine cents, and all of a sudden now your revenue is dropping. So it could work both ways. That uh, that chart I sent you earlier today, did you take a look at that? I, I did briefly. Um, I don't know. I bet I can find it again. Um, you had, I think, a, a seven day on there, a twenty one day. Um, let me go back to Facebook and grab it. Let me see. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the video so people can see it, but it, uh, yeah. You know, what I'm doing there is I've got yeah. the, bar, the bar chart is the raw data for the day. This is yep. Yep. AMP reads on a, my, the first book in a, this fiction that I write under a pen name. The black sure. line is 21 day. The green yep. line is, is, is seven day moving average. Uh -huh. So just looking at that, what would you, what are some of the things that are interesting to you? Well, it's interesting that you, um, it, it appears that the, uh, okay, so seven day is the, the green. green. The 21 day is the black. Yeah, so we just had a big drop. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is interesting. Yeah, what happened on 8-8? Eight, eight? Oh, that was the start. Okay, well, I, I, I know I, what happened. Here, um, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, as far as how you updated your data, presumably and this looks like it's an Excel graph, so you're, you're putting your data into Excel, correct? Correct. Okay, here's my question. Are you putting it in every day? I, like each day you add the additional days? Yes. The, the previous day? Yeah. Okay, have you gone back and from eight, uh, I would go all the way back to 728 and delete out that data, go do a new data and do a reload because this graph kind of shows it, but the server farms, this is rumored, I, I don't have confirmation of this, but it's rumored that Amazon had some issues because of the fires in the great Northwest mm -hmm. with some of their server farms and it caused some delays in reporting. And there was a span of about four or five days, which uh, corresponds very closely with when your data plummeted. I'm guessing there's more page reads there than your, your chart shows. There, there may be, the other thing is, is I actually turned off my ads. Oh, on, well, on the first. Okay, well, then, then, then that's probably more your answer than the other. <laughs> yeah. But was, never, what, nevertheless, you, if you haven't dumped, you know, redumped the last week's worth of data, and you will probably see some of those numbers go up because uh, my own personal stuff, I've been doing that. Now, the last, today's the eight, the last three days have had no change, but mm -hmm. the 28th through the third and fourth, in there, I mean, it was substantial for one client uh, who, I mean, I, when I redid the data, it went from 100 and, 
or 101,000 page reads on that day to I think 138,000. So I mean, that's you know, 37,000 page reads yeah. on that day did not show up the next day. Mm -hmm. It didn't show up until like 48 hours later. So uh, it was, you know, uh, 30, 30, well, almost exactly 37% of the page reads weren't there. Um, but again, I think those will mostly probably impact the days prior to you turning off all your ads. Yeah. So. And so really the point of bringing that up is to show this is pretty simple stuff to do and that yeah. I'm just cutting and pasting that data into uh, Excel spreadsheet and creating yeah. a graph and stretching yeah. it out to catch those days. And that becomes a really simple, you know, indicator light on the panel for my business of, Oh, the green line's going below the black line. Something yeah. is wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so but I don't, have, you've got a few days worth of data about turning off your ads. Um, now what we can't see, okay, so this is, this is page reads. Um, this is just page reads. Just this, page reads. This doesn't have sales units. This doesn't yeah. have revenue. Uh, another way to analyze your same data is looking at net revenue because, well, the numbers have dropped. I don't know what you were bidding. I can't tell what your bid was. Let's say you were bidding a dollar a click. Well, it's entirely possible that even though you're down to almost no page reads, if you were losing money prior to the first, mm -hmm. then, then the revenue version of this graph, these, the trend line could be shifting the other direction. Right, so, right. Um, that, that's another point that I think people should understand is that you just can't analyze with one piece of data. You can't just look at the page reads or just look at the sales or just look at the revenue. Uh, I mean, even looking at just profits is, I mean, it seems like, oh, well, I should be able to just see how much profit I'm making. There are stories to be had with understanding, if you know your read through and all, the, the volume of people that are coming into your funnels. And so you have to look at, you have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle and you have to do them the way you're doing them because that's how you see when things change. Now, it's interesting, those, there are three days on there where you had uh, nearly 2,000 page reads, and most of the days were in the 500 to 1,000 or even below. Um, any idea what those, those spike days were? Um, yeah, I, I do. Um, oh, I'm actually, it, it, not to get you back on your hobby horse, but I'm playing around with copy. Oh. Well, I'll, I can stay off five yours. No, that, that's, that's, that's good. And <laughs> right, so, so that, 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 this is this is how I'm actually actually validate. So that and this these charts are part of a bigger thing where I'm tracking read through. So when I do my read through, it's actually I'm doing um, a 21 day moving average on read through. That's excellent. Right. And so I've got a, and then the other thing I track in this suite of stuff is rate of change. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So that's a little, that's like a derivative for the kind of the yeah. folks out there. That's a derivative where I'm trying to see how fast things are changing from day to day in those averages. So, there you, go. How, so you know, am I stepping on the gas faster? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't have that in the chart I sent you, but that's in that no, same. No. Yeah, that, that same vein of analysis. Yeah. So and this is how I'm trying to figure out some of the things like that you talk about where like, okay, if I'm running a series of ads and I change the copy and then I, I have to let it sit and ruminate and figure it sure. out. Well, this is the fastest way for me to see any kind of indication. Absolutely. Right? And when, when you're talking about changing the copy, are you, are you changing the copy on the description page or do you mean the copy of your individual ads? Both. Both? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's, and that for me, like you wouldn't be able to see it, but I know on my scratch pad, I have the dates when I've done stuff. Sure. Sure. So what ads are running, uh -huh. which have different copy. And then there's times where I change my page description copy. Uh, absolutely. And this, and this is another thing that people don't realize is that they, underestimate the value of the description copywriting 
and overestimate the value of the ad copyright. It's not to say that ad copywriting isn't important, but I've written thousands, I mean, my own ads have written thousands, but then helping other people, and it's rare. Maybe one tenth of one percent of the time does a bit of ad copy move the needle. Because most people, the way the human brain works with regards to memory, when they read the ad copy, by the time they get done reading your description, if you've written a good enough hook and gotten them to the bottom, they won't be able to recall what the ad copy was. And that's 99.9% you know, .9 of the time, they'll not remember your copy. The other thing is, a lot of time people just like the look of the cover, so they click on that. Mm. But occasionally, you will write copy that they will find to be freaking hilarious. And I did it once, and I, I talked about it in my book. For my satire, the copy was more snark than a snarkopotamus in snark town on a snarking spree. And that copy, those ads, the ROI was between 700 and 900%. And I say ads plural because every time the ad died, I used the same copy over and and just kept pounding that every way I could, that ad copy. And it, for six or eight weeks, I got a lot of track, traction out of that one bit of copy. Now, out of the thousands of ads I've written, I only reuse copy maybe 10 or 20 times over thousands of ads. So most of them, I'm always trying something new. But I found one that worked. The interesting thing is during that two-month period, this is a book that is a 4.3 average. But for two months, all but one of the reviews I got were five stars. Hmm. So I had a span of 4.9 something because the copy absolutely nailed it. Again, you're going to write a thousand ads to get one of those that matters. And my point being that people spend a lot of time in my group or other groups asking, oh, I'm going to write this Amazon ad. Which copy do you like best? If they spend three minutes trying to get people's opinions, they could have written another ad. And it's better off just to go with stuff because the Snarkopotamus ad copy, the only reason I went with it is because at that point I had written maybe 25 ads, some for that book, some for others. And I was just tired of writing ads. And I was like, I'm gonna get one more. Because I made a goal of like 25 and I had one more to do. As like screw it, more snark there, snark upon them, and snark town on a snarking spree. It made me laugh. I hit run. I mean, each ad takes a minute and a half of your time to run. If you're spending ten minutes trying to think of the copy, you're you're not investing your time wisely because most of the time it doesn't matter. Should you try to get that one in a thousand ad copy? Absolutely, because when you hit it, it's a it's just, it's money, you know, falling from the heavens, mm. but don't let it take over your day. You yeah. should still be just banging them out. Sometimes I just write ads. You'll like, you'll like this book because it's a good thriller. That's not great ad copy. That's not, but it doesn't do that different from the ones where I'm really trying. What matters though is the description and that's, that's where I've been able to absolutely improve my conversion rate substantially because that's where people are spending the most amount of time. The ad is only a few seconds. So, uh, makes just, sense. I, 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 I got on my copywriting horse. I couldn't, I know. Just, and I let you get up there. I could have kicked you off. I you did. <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so back on moving averages, what, um, how, how are you using them in your business? I know you, you've got a, your super spreadsheet that you I do. And I'm redesigning the super spreadsheet. But I, like, how do you use it in other parts of what you do? And how can, well, I mean, I, I, it just, it, it, it's always there. It's something that I spend a couple hours every single day looking at data and it's, it is just, it's go, it's, there, there are so many data points so many things you can measure, so many different ways you can measure it, that without those moving averages, without, I have, again, this massive Excel thing, and I can go through, and I choose a drop down, I choose a different book, and it, maybe I see something interesting, maybe it's not conclusive, so I will then just 
increase the range. I mean, I'll just add more to my spreadsheet and, mm-hmm. and look at it differently. I just, again, for, for this other author was looking at his data. And this is data that I've looked at a lot over the last nine months. And I just saw something yesterday I'd never seen because of, well, let me try this. Let me look at this data a different way with a different moving average and see what happens. And it's, and it's about, well, for, for one of the ways of using the moving averages that I like is I will do my, my moving average for clicks against my moving average for other things like page reads. So watching the click graph, so maybe the clicks goes up like this and then down and then up. And it's interesting that the page reads will follow yeah. the same path. But you just it's, see. Not, it's not just that it's trending upward. I want to see what is, the, what is the lag between the clicks and the page reads. Is it, is it a seven day gap? If, if all of a sudden I have a big spike here, I don't see it the next day because it takes people a while to read the books. I see it maybe five days later where, where, where that, that changed. So you can have a big spike on one day and not really get much of anything, but your seven day move average out seven, you know, a week or so. Now it's already turned the corner and you see how the, the strength of correlation between the amount of clicks you're getting and the page reads, and then looking at, um, well, again, knowing the, the time, the length of time it takes to impact, but then taking that data and then saying, and you brought this up, what does that same graph look like for the series? Mm-hmm. So now I may only be pouring clicks into book one, but those clicks impact all six books in the series. So now I'm looking at, well, what is the global impact of all of the book? And that will, that will be a less dramatic relative to the clicks because people are reading through now. So if I get a big up spike here, it looks differently, looks different on the series. And then you can look at, you can look at it by revenue. You can look at it by sales. You can compare, uh, th- this is again, another thing that I watch closely is I want to know the distribution of conversions what for every one paid sale that you get how many KU downloads do you get now you can't measure that on a daily basis you have to measure that over time mm-hmm. and so th- this isn't necessarily a moving average thing but taking a 90 day block of time because when you're analyzing uh, read through you need a large block of time if you got three books in the series you need less time than if you have eight books in the series because it takes longer for people to read it. If the book is a long book, you need more time. So if I'm looking at an author who has two books in their series, but each one of them is 150,000 words, it may take longer for a person to read through those first two in the epic trilogy where he hasn't even finished the third book than it does to read through the first three books of my Henry Wood series because they're short, I mean, relative to the total volume. And so when you're looking at these metrics, the seven day moving average or a giant before and after, if you've made a major change like a description or calculating read through, you have to think about the behavior of the user to determine what's a reasonable period of time to do your analysis. And so if, if you ask somebody, if, if somebody asked me, well, how, how much time do you need to analyze your Henry Wood series? I'll answer them, but it's really not helpful unless they have a you know, five, well, I guess there's four books in the Henry Wood series and they're of the same length and they're in the, the same genre. Because I think romance readers read through things more quickly than other readers. And so, the, again, the, these are all things that I look at on a daily basis. And, well, just, and I, yeah. to follow on to that, I know because I track my read through on a 21 day moving, aver- moving average daily uh-huh. that 
there's fluctuations based on what I've attributed it to now is book launches. Oh, that's absolutely. Yeah. Right. Book so like there's, so right. There's times where my read through from book one to two is as high as 80%. I've had times where it's below 40. Sure. But if you've just launched book six and you're getting readers that haven't read the first five, they'll go back to book one. Right, right. And then that's going to feed through that whole process and, well, and that data is going to ratchet along. And here's what I want people to understand about your point there that is, is incredibly important because if you didn't ever launch, if you just, if you finished a series and it's six books and you don't ever change your back matter, which everybody does back matter wrong, but you just got that six book series after six months of data without making any changes, your read through from book one to book two is going to be the same forever. If it's 41 to 42%, it will be in that range forever if you're not adding a book seven. And maybe read through from two to three is 82%, and it will be there forever. But with what you talked about, if you launch a book seven, you're going from seven to one and then one to two is not a true one to two. It's really a second book for that person. And so for all the people that you pour into book seven, you're going to be for a period of time artificially inflating the one to two read through mm -hmm. because it's really a two to three. So they've, they've read the first one. Now they've read book one. They're committed. So now they're performing at an 80% read through for that period of time. But then a year later, when however many people you poured into, have, they've all finished the book and made their decision on book one and finished that and made that decision, then your data will, will, will go back to the, the, again, if you've not made any uh, significant changes to how you're doing your back matter and it will always be the same but this goes back to thinking about what is happening it's not that all of a sudden the, the book one to book two got better it's that it was people were coming at it from a different way and they were reading book one with a different perspective than than the people starting out there and so so I'm going to completely unrelated topic, but I'm going to tell you a data sure. story. I know you'll get excited. I might bore the watchers. Shit. Well, then they, they, they can, they can go check out Facebook during this story yeah. and then come back at the end. But, but this shows how um, you can use data to figure stuff out. So I told you before I used to work for a pricing analytics company. Sure. We had a company and they sold medical supplies. Okay. They were just a distributor of that stuff into a bunch of different villages. One of their big products that they made money off of, was the plastic cover that goes on thermometers. You know, the digital oh, sure. thermometers. You see I, I absolutely, yep. Right? I know exactly what you're talking about. Traditional uh, razor, razor blade model, where like you sell the device that's a nice piece, but the real money is the recurring revenue from selling that consumable. People yeah, absolutely. Through. Okay. They start, first off, we're doing pricing analytics, so we're playing with pricing. They, st they start to see some, they see a significant volume drop in those items and they think it's our fault. Uh -huh. So we start doing some analysis and we see this drop and we also go back in history and we see two other drops like that. And we, interesting, significant volume drops. And we start to do some analysis and we align those drops with another product taking off that being infrared thermometers. Oh, there you go. And infrared doesn't require the, doesn't require the cover. Safety. Yep. And it's touchless, so you don't actually have to physically touch the person. Yeah. And we then dug deeper, and each one of those events was tied to a particular health scare, like swine flu or sure. the bird SARS. We, they were like right along those big yeah. things. So what was happening was we went back to the customer and said, here's what happens. People freak out because of whatever the latest mad cow, get, mad cow yep. and they need a bunch of thermometers now to check people. And when they go to order, they order the infrared because it's about the same price. 
uh -huh. a little bit more. And the minute you get that, you don't need the covers anymore. Sure. So you're actually cannibalized. The, the point to them was like, this is a cannibalization issue. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, 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 the way you normally analyze the data didn't get you to that answer. No. You had to go deeper, just like I talked about the way I normally analyzed the first book in free didn't work on that test. And you, you have to dig deeper. But I, for those that have been looking at their Facebook and you know, pictures of cats doing cute things and weren't interested in the data story, you don't know the rush of <laughs> discovering something. When you're pouring through the data and you find find a, a bit of treasure. If I do this, oh, well, I mean, I, I'm not going to talk at length about this, but I did a kind of weird book bub ads test, not the promotion, but where you run the daily ads. Mm -hmm. And it looked like out of the gate, it was a break even thing. 10, 10 days after we, we did it, it looked like it was, it was break even. I mean, the day we did it, it looked like it was maybe going to be a loser, but I, I knew there was probably some hidden KU downloads that, that I just couldn't see yet, so I was going to give it some time. Now we are 48 days since this weird thing we did, and the ROI has continued to climb. The baseline of page reads for this this book that it just doesn't make sense that we would even use it for this test, but we did 48 days out looking at the series, the jump, the ROI is now probably north of 140% on something that 10 days out looked like it was a break even proposition. And it is, it has just been an incredibly slow thing to go, but, and there's been no other advertising. We, we stopped all ads. So it was all, this is the only, the only factor. And now 48 days out, it is still well above the baseline and, and flat. And the only conclusion I have now is that the number of people that saw that, cause it was, it was an ad for a price drop to two ninety nine on a box set. And the number of people that just said, well, you know, I'm in KU, so I might as well get it. I mean, the conversion rate was vastly better than what it appeared based on the sales. Hmm. Uh, you know, I thought we had these sales and maybe a couple of KU people, but now these, you know, 45 days later, it, it, it crushed it. And that, that's a, an area where people also get impatient. They, they run an ad and it's like, I, I ran an ad and it was approved 12 hours ago. You know what? I'm not rich yet. <laughs> just, what am I doing wrong? Please help. And it's like, no, it's going to take you six months to learn this stuff. It's hard. And so length of time for analysis absolutely matters and it varies depending on what you're looking at. If you're looking at box sets, they're big. They take a longer time. And so you, you get in the habit of, trying to understand your product, just like you did with the thermometer things. There had to be a reason because, I mean, a thermometer cover is a pretty generic type thing. I imagine it would be similar to a tongue depressor mm -hmm. or what have you. And so they need tongue depressors. And, you know, it's got to be price and elastic. If you raise it a little bit, I mean, you can't go through the roof just because. Uh, well, and it was one of these things. Insane, but where the obvious, you know, the, what, the big thing that had changed in their business was that they were having us do pricing. Sure. And analytics, so, and we were changing they blame that right out so of the gate. Yeah. The first thing is like, you're screwing up our volume. Yeah. And, um, and we, we, we had to deal with this a lot where we yeah. would get put on our back foot and it, their immediate thing was like, it has to be your volume. Yeah. Uh, your, your work that's causing the issue with the volume. And the, the, the reality is most people don't understand is, is it like you would have to lose over 10% of your business to offset a 3% price increase. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And that goes back to the e-com theory that we talked about at the beginning. Right. And, and most people think, why, why don't I have this huge volume response when I drop my price 10%? You right. would have to have an even bigger, you know, there would have to be a massive volume yeah. response. That, that, that's exactly it. And, and, what, and what we're doing is we're, we, we're actually analyzing the things that are most, um, uh, most price sensitive. So my, my analogy is milk and toothpicks. So yeah. what we do is we say, we're going to set the price of milk in this store to attract customers to come in. Mm -hmm. And then when they come over and, you know, the wife calls and says, hey, pick up a box of toothpicks. Sure. I mean, do you know what a box of toothpick costs? No, I have no idea. You don't care. You just want to buy them. Yep. And, 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 but that's where we're going to, you know, we're going to gouge you like oh, a wounded bull. Right? Well, <laughs> You, you, you mentioned the classic razor, razor blade. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in every marketing book for the last 70 years, 80 yeah. years since, since Gillette discovered that. Yeah. Is that the money's in the razor blades and the, 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 and the modern equivalent, the printer cartridges, but even more so in the last five years, SaaS, software as a service, is the modern day Gillette razor blade because... Companies now, they, they no longer look at, can we get $600 for our office suite of, of products? We would rather get $40 a month forever. And well, then we'll, we'll keep updating it, but the revenue stream now has been flattened out. So instead of getting our spike every 18 months with the new release and making all of our money there, we have converted that. We're making more money. It's flat over time. But I, there, I wanted to go back to your point on the analysis and people not understanding. I had a woman who changed her description and she watched it for 30 days, like I told her to. And she came back and said, oh, I changed it back. It didn't work. Well, I had seen her old description. It was horrible. And I didn't believe her. And so we started looking at the then and she said, well, I had this many sales before and this many sales after. I was like, okay, well, what about, you know, tell me the rest of the analysis. And she goes, well, no, that's, that's all I needed to know is that the sales dropped. Did you look at the clicks? Well, she had stopped advertising too. <laughs> and so the, the going from like 2,500 clicks to 1,100 clicks, that was the driving factor in the drop off in sales is that she wasn't advertising or it wasn't that she had stopped advertising. It was that she hadn't written any new ads and they had died off over time mm -hmm. during her test. And so when we looked at the conversion rate, it had been a substantial improvement. Her, I mean, she was converting much more frequently with the new description than she was with the old, but she was making less money because she just wasn't spending money on ads and, mm -hmm. And so that's why you can't look at your revenue only. It doesn't paint the whole picture, just like you couldn't look at the the units only in your thermometer example. You have mm. to dig deeper. And it's people want the easy button. They just want to say, well, oh well, if I look I look at the end of the month, how much is in my bank account? That tells me if what I did differently was good or bad. And no, it doesn't. It's just it's no better than guessing. No, no, and certainly now with, you know, my observation of what Amazon's doing with the advertising and, you know, making more area on every product page to put ads, yep. it's, you know, it's getting to be pay to play. And if people aren't careful, what they're going to do is they may increase their sales, but what they're not going to see is that their actual margins went down because of how much they're in losing on ads or not losing but spending to keep those oh, oh, the, the absolute what which again one cat just look at the margins mm -hmm. i did an analysis three weeks ago and this guy had statistically significant data he had a lot of data and a lot of time six weeks before six weeks after the roi before was 251 percent the roi after was 91 percent the before, I don't remember how much money he made. I just remember the difference between actual net profit on the before and net profit on the after. 
on the after he, he spent a lot more on ads. Mm -hmm. He made $35 more on the after at 91% than he did on the before at 250%. Yeah. So again, that goes back to you can't look at one metric because mm. if you just said to a person, would you rather have 250% or 91%, they'll all choose 250. But in this case, I mean, it, for all intents and purposes, with, with the volume of money we we're talking about, $35 was a virtual tie. But the fact that the 91% came out on top illustrates the point, I think, pretty well. Well, and to your point, in this business, where that, your two scenarios where they're drastically different is in working capital. Yeah. Because in the first one, you're not using nearly the amount, you're not having the big cash flow gap that you would have in the second event, right? Because you, you put all that money in, the, in scenario two out in ad spend to wait 60 days to get your cash. Yeah. From a business operation standpoint, that's horrifically worse than the other situation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the, the other thing is even at six weeks, there, we, don't, we don't know that all the revenue is in because – of the length of series and all. So sure, well, it was a sure. $35 difference. The, the long run, if we look at it at 90 days, it, it, it may be a more significant win. Uh, but, but, but again, yeah, you, you have to factor that stuff in. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was an author who I started working with her. She came to me when I first opened my group February 24th of last year, 2017, because I'm sure people are going to watch this in 2025 and they'll want to know what year I'm talking about. Um, your stuff is all evergreen. It's got to be. So yep. the, the point is she came to me. Well, with, they'll know it's an old one because it won't be the super chair. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, she came to me. She was doing a thousand dollars a month, had a massive catalog. And I said, this is insane. You, the, you're only making a thousand dollars a month. And she said, well, you know, I don't know how to do ads. So I taught her and I said, you can only pick one of your series. She had a, I mean, she runs her business like a publishing company. She picked one eight book series. I said, you're going to learn Amazon ads on that series. You're going to be tempted to try to just do everything, but don't just get good at it. So for three months, she just focused on the one series and she got good at it. And then I said, you can pick a second series. And so she did. She spent the time. She did all the analysis that you and I have been talking about. She used my tools. She she absolutely did everything right. And at about month five or something, the question of cash flow came in where she was, she was now doing more money than she'd ever imagined in her life. And she had the ability to scale up, but she didn't have any more money. Mm -hmm. And I said, how are your credit cards? And, and that sounds insane to people. But I said, listen, your ROI right now is north of 200 percent it doesn't matter what you're paying on your credit cards run them up max them out because you've got you know 25 days grace period before the interest starts and the interest for a you know another five weeks until you get paid from that money you spent is not 250 percent it's tiny Mm -hmm. And so she did that and that was enough where she was, she then had the margin or the, 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 the cash flow. Yeah. The, the, the resource that she, she didn't, she didn't ever run out there. And then she, she paid her card off when the money came in. But at the end of the year on 80,000 in spend, she had 200,000 in revenue with on December 30th. Mm -hmm. So she had 120,000 left over, but her real tipping point was when she turned to the credit cards and could really scale things up. Yeah. Because I, if you don't have I, access to that working capital, it would have asphyxiated the business. It, it, it absolutely would have. And so, yeah. I mean, this is a woman that was on pace to have 12,000 in profit for the year and she had 120,000. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I'm not telling this is for anybody listening. This is not me telling you to max out your credit cards. This was me telling her based on the analysis of her data and how well she was doing that in her situation, it made sense. Well, I think that another way to put it is, is that when you get ready to do these projects, 
you have to understand the impact of the working capital, right? Absolutely. As a business gets bigger and bigger and bigger, its lungs get bigger and it needs to breathe in more cash, yep. right? And people don't understand. It's like, well, my business gets bigger. I'm going to have more cash. You will, but there's going to need to be more that stays in the system all the time, exactly. especially in an author business where there's a 60 day pay window. Yep. So but the beauty of the 60 day pay window though, is the last two months of the year. Because if we assume that we're going to keep writing books and we're going to keep growing our business, we can spend obscene amounts of money the last two months of the year. And that comes off 2018's taxes, but we don't get the revenue. And so if we have that huge push and spend a ton of money at the end of the year, we are reducing our tax burden in 2018. And then all that revenue is getting dumped into the next year. I mean, we'll have to pay taxes on it, but yeah, not yeah. for another year. And so, the, I mean, this goes back to your, your expert on the tax stuff, but that 60 day window the, I mean, there's a plus side to it as well. And sure, every, sure. every detail matters. It does, you know, and it's a great, your the fact that the business is on a cash basis, you can certainly at the end of the year play, play those that hand, but you know, where most authors get themselves jammed up, especially in more so on launches, right? They don't understand that launch, what I call the launch trough, right? Like by the time those, if you've got advertising, you've got book costs, you've got all that stuff going out, it takes a long time to, for that money to start coming in and filling in that, yeah. that hole you've made. And it's no different. Launching every month like some of these authors yeah, and it's no different than any other bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Oh no, yeah, you, you're you're right. It's just, it's just like any business with the expenses. Yeah, you know when you a lot of businesses say, well, we're you know we're going to grow our sales, so they hire a sales guy, or they hire a couple sales guys, and those guys get a car and they get a computer and then they got to go out and get customers uh -huh. and all that all that time those costs are adding up before the guy starts getting proposals out and sales coming in and you collect the cash from that sale. You could be in the whole hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and, and it's the same thing for authors. They don't understand the sales guys they're sending out of their books and they have to go out and do their work before they actually turn into cash and come back. And, um, and then you roll into that, like I'm going to be really aggressive with advertising, which is great. You just got to plan. You've got to plan. Yes. And you have to understand just where, the way all the moving parts work. There aren't any shortcuts, mm -hmm. and that's that's why in chapter five of my book I talk about setting expectations. If you want to start learning anything, Amazon ads, Pinterest ads, Facebook ads. If you uh, some people try to do it with Google AdWords, I, I I know I couldn't make money doing that, but some people are good at it. It there's a learning curve, and the expectations. If you set your expectations right and think of that period of time, whether it's the hiring new salespeople, you have to figure out those, that hundred thousand dollars I'm spending to get them all set up. When am I going to see my first dollar from that? When am I going to see the hundred thousand? And if you go into it thinking that you're going to see it you know, that first month, <laughs> you're going to be a Tuesday. You're going to be sorely disappointed. But if you're planning and you say, okay, this is gonna be a hundred thousand investment and they're really not going to start generating revenue for four months. Can I afford to have that money sunk for four months? Yes, I can. Then do it. No, it'll bankrupt me and I'll lose the business. Then, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, well, and that's, um, you know, most, most venture capital that comes into businesses, it's because they know there's a scalable system that all it really needs is a ton of capital to scale it up. Right? Uh -huh. And they know they're going to punch out three to five years. Somebody else will then take it to the next level. But if they don't see that there's a, a reliable, repeatable system that all they need to do is pour their cash in, they're not going to invest. That's the great oh. thing about the author business is if you get these things right, I mean, not that we're saying you should run up credit cards or take money out of your 401k, but if you've done the work, then it, it looks, it could look like a really promising way to 
get to the the promised land. Oh, oh, absolutely. And again, going back to the learning curve, at this point, I think I mentioned it earlier, the, I, I'm going to be doing a, a nonfiction series in this niche I've found. And it's, I, there, I, there just aren't really any indie authors that I can find that are playing in the niche. It's a, it, it, the potential I think is massive. I think I can write 15,000 word books on this subject matter. I've already got a list of 50 potential books. I've, I've started writing, but I'm really not going to, because of this, all this coding I'm doing on the, the redesign of my Excel tool, in about a week or so, I'm going to turn my attention to every day trying to crank out two to 3,000 words, so maybe two books a month. And because of all of the learning I've done over the last six years about this business, I'm going into a niche that I, I, I mean, I have a co-author because it's not something that I can write about. She's not a writer. She's going to write the outlines and the beats, and then I'm going to do the writing. And we are going to put together these books in over a couple of years, maybe bang out 50 of them, and we're going to absolutely own it because I've learned all of the moving parts. Mm. I know how to do the advertising, you know, the copywriting, all these different things. I understand all the stuff you're talking about as far as the capital expenditure. I know that if I'm going to, before I start making money from these books, this is just, this is exactly like the salespeople. It's going to take a while to get this brand to the point where it is the go-to for people in this niche. I know that. I'm going to spend money on editors, probably six or seven covers before I start to really get it rolling and start to recoup the money. So it's going to be, I'm going to be probably eight or $9,000 into this project before the revenue really starts to turn on. But again, I analyze the books that existed in it. They're all doing it wrong. I look at where their sales were. I did the math. And once I take over this niche, it's going to be just a huge uh, thing for me. And then all the other books coming out, I'll have that built-in market. And so mm. I understand that it's probably, you know, maybe eight to $10,000 investment that I won't see much of anything back for six months and then it will take off and should do very well for me. And then I'll write a book about that experience. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, we've been on quite some time and although I could yeah. BS with you for hours, we probably should wrap this up. Sounds good. Um, so tell us what you got going on, where people can find you. Well, uh, all the exciting yeah. stuff about. I, I, I'm known buying. for my, my mastering Amazon ads and author's guide book. I have a Facebook group by the same name. It's up to almost 6,000 people, 5,835 as of before this meeting. That's where you can find me. I'm very active in the group. I answer questions. I do have a requirement for the group that you buy the book just because the discussions in the group, none of them are, how do I run an ad? It's pretty much assumed that you've read the book and you know how to put an ad in the system and you've got some of the basics down and we're dealing with more advanced topics. So mm -hmm. that's where you can find me. I have a course uh, that is about analytics and copywriting. I mean, it's called Mastering Amazon Ads but the focus is the things you need to do to make the ads work. By the time you're willing to spend the money on the course, there isn't much more to talk about on Amazon ads. It's the analytics that let you really excel and maximize your ROI. And the most exciting thing, for the last 10 days, I've been redesigning this Excel tool, which I'm going to, have you ever done I don't, I don't want to extend the show, but I'm curious, have you ever done a, a pay what it's worth sort of product? Uh, I've never done that. I, I've always been amazed by that. The, the um, radio heads in rainbows yeah. album. Yeah. Um, they made more money on that album than they did all the previous albums combined because yeah, they were no, I, I know that story. And there's, there's a lot of them out there. So, yeah. I, I, I created this Excel tool that is, makes a lot of people cry 
And I originally designed it because it had the, the high level metrics that I needed to analyze my data. And the pain and anguish and tears that people went through to get to the point where they weren't just terrified of these reports that I created it all made sense to me. I mean, they were massive amounts of data, these huge screens of just rows and rows and rows of things. It just, it, it freaked people out. But the people that got over their math phobia and learned it, those are all the ones that are doing five figures a month now because yeah. they read my book and use it. So for a long time, I've decided I need to make a version that is not intimidating. And that's what I've been doing for 10 days. I, I've literally, other than this and one other podcast, yeah, I wake up and I code for 10 or 12 hours and then I sleep and then I wake up and do it again. And so I've been on this just nonstop cycle. When I get this thing done though, I'm going to give it away. There's going to be the light version, which I, I'm, well, I'm going to give them both away, but there'll be the light version. And then I'm just going to have a little pop up or something in it, or I don't know what, but a, a, do a Patreon. And you know what? Well, you can do it. You can do it with a. Um, you can do it with the PayPal button. After this, oh, I, 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 I could do it with the PayPal button. I hadn't thought about that. I was thinking of Patreon because people in the group, because they they often like DM me, ask, they they say, hey, well, can I give you something for this? Because I'll spend an hour on them. I mean, mm -hmm. somebody I've never met can send a message to me, and if they've got a question that I can't answer in two minutes, I'll get on and do a Skype with them. We'll talk for an hour or two. They say, oh, can, can I give you something? And so I'm like, no, nah, it's okay. But they really want to. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to set up a Patreon, and it will just sort of be this catch-all where if people feel like they wanted to pay me for my time, they can go do it. And this tool is, I believe it's going to go after the, uh, there are reports out there, book reports is one that a lot of people use. It's free. And it gives you basic, I mean, it's just numbers of the data. It doesn't have anything to do with ads. This is so, I mean, this is light years ahead of that. And I think people will be willing to like, hey, yeah, I'll give you two bucks a month for that. And it, it, I mean, it will change their lives. It is, it is going to allow people to see their data in ways without doing the math themselves. They can just boom, go to a report. There is their read through just by you know picking the first book in the series it'll give you the whole series all of the stuff that i talk about and preach over and over that you need to know your numbers it's all going to be done for them and you know i think people will give me a, a couple bucks a month and you know if i get a few thousand of them it could be a pretty big pretty big deal for what is going to end up being about two weeks worth of work so that's what i'm excited about um i've never i've never done one of these pay what you think it's worth um, Ultimately, if I make just zero, it doesn't matter because the point of the tool is I want to help people in the group. And mm -hmm. I already had a tool for them. It was just people didn't, they were afraid of it. So I was going to do the rebuild anyway. I might as well learn, learn another subject. And that subject is pay as you go. I mean, there's so many things in the business world that can be helpful <laughs> at a different point in life that I'm excited about studying that field well maybe we can do another show about that well what i'd like to do um is talk to you further about this because in the next book i'm i've got um a book i'm putting out called um direct sales unleashed which is about selling your books direct and it has sure. a secondary follow-on book that i'm selling direct because i'm talking about selling books direct sure called um uh, supercharger fans and how to design a customer nurturing engine. So I've done a ton of research on the different platforms to sell things on. Uh -huh. I could just like share with you and then you can say, well, maybe this is a better way to do it or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm open to anything. I just yeah. think that the potential for pay what you think it's worth is, is pretty huge because in everything I've read, people, will pay more than you think it's worth. And so there's a lot of people out there paying $10 a month for book report. Mm -hmm. my, my Excel tool, now it, it's gonna require every day, three minutes of your time, 
maybe five minutes to update the data. So it's not plugged into anything, it's not automated, but again, that three to five minutes, what you're gonna get as far as analysis and really knowing what is going on with your books by like just going report to report is, I mean, people are just, there's, it's gonna change their lives. And so I, my prediction is that people will see this tool and they'll look at $10 a month for something that they don't have to do anything. Or maybe I could just give him the $10 a month and I'll spend the five minutes a day to update it and get a thousand percent more information that I can use to run my business like a grown up. <laughs> and so, but like I say, you know, I'm going to say, Hey, you know, if you think it's worth a couple bucks a month, that's great. But I may be wrong and it, maybe it's a thousand people give me 10 bucks a month. I don't know. I mean, I already make more money than I spend to live. So it doesn't matter if it's a success or failure. Mm -hmm. I'm most interested in the data and what I will learn from it. If, if it made me $30,000 a month, well, I would probably spend some of it on crazy vacations or uh, going to silly sporting events. But um, anyway, um, oh, I'm sorry. Now my phone's ringing. Uh, anyway, that was a very long close up to our thing there. I didn't mean to go off on another topic. No, no, I'll edit that that's in. What I'm <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that's all there is about me. Find me at, at my Facebook page. And, uh, all right. I'll make sure I put that in the, uh, the notes here. So it was great, great talking to you again, Brian, and we'll definitely get on here. Uh, hey, I would, I'd love to do a show in six months and talk about the whole pay as you go thing. Cause I think it's going to be interesting. Sure. I mean, right. it'll, be, it'll be interesting even if it fails. Well, it ties in with some stuff I'm doing too. So we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. Sounds good. I right. enjoyed the sh doing the show as always. Thanks. All right.